everyone, and welcome to your last lecture in Module 3. So today we will be talking about the food revolution, but we'll be switching hemispheres to talk about how the development of agriculture went down in North and South America. So in evolutionary time, domestication emerged essentially simultaneously in many parts of the world at the start of what's called the Holocene, so roughly 10,000 BC. As we talked about in lecture 3.2, the earliest forms of agriculture that we have in the world come from the Near East and date to roughly between 9,000 and 7,000 BC. Following on the tales of the development of agriculture in the Near East, we, have, we see the appearance of domestication in central Mexico around about 7,000 BC. And then in China, particularly along the Yangtze River, by roughly 6,500 BC. Followed by evidence in South America, as well as in the Eastern United States. A recent bit of evidence has shown that there's actually evidence for much earlier forms of domestication, particularly of taro and yam, in Papua New Guinea than had ever been imagined before. So there are many lines of evidence that archeologists have drawn on to document these simultaneous domestication efforts across the world. Mapping the distribution of wild progenitors is one strategy that was developed by Nikolai Vav Vavilov, a Russian botanist and geneticist. Vavilov sought to, to study the history of domestication as a way of addressing famine in Stalinist Russia and elsewhere. To do so, he created a massive seed bank that Hitler actually attempted to steal. One of the major contributions of Vavilov's research was to point out the various different ways in which domestication likely occurred. So he said that he reasoned that a domesticate likely originated in an area where it is currently grown naturally, its wild ancestors are also present, and its wild ancestors exhibit high natural diversity. Another line of evidence that archaeologists use to examine the origins of domestication is macrobotanical remains, basically the remains of seeds and plant fragments. A pioneer in this regard was Robert Braidwood, who identified seed samples at the Jarmo site in Iraq in 1947. These seeds were then radiocarbon dated and produced a date before 6000 BC. Based on this interdisciplinary evidence, Braidwood argued that domestication must have arisen in the natural habitats of wild ancestors, a conclusion very similar to Vavilov's. Another source of evidence are what's called phytoliths. Phytoliths are basically vegetable tissues, the remains and husks of things like grain, corn, etc. The identification of pollen grains as well as phytoliths indicate that early agriculturalists were using bladed threshing sledges to harvest crops. By looking at the structure of phytoliths, archaeologists have been able to compare the genetic fingerprint of modern and ancient domesticates and to determine their original homelands and subsequent spread. In addition to these scientific forms of analysis associated with phytoliths and pollens and macrobotanicals, we also have the straightforward uh, material culture associated with the development of agriculture. So all of these kind of agricultural tools, which 
developed in, in, in response to domestication. So things like these threshing sledges, which you see uh, on the slide behind me, um, as well as uh, large ground stones for digging, uh, knives for cutting, all sorts of implements like this. So there's six kind of major centers of domestication across the globe. As we talked about in Lecture 3.2, Southwest Asia has the earliest archaeological evidence for domestication, particularly of crops like wheat, barley, lentils, as well as animals like sheep, goat, and pigs. Another early area for domestication is East Asia, but the crops here for domestication are slightly different, with a focus on millet and rice, as well as the domestication of chickens and pigs, rather than things like wheat. We also have evidence for early domestication in Africa. Again, a different kind of set of crops associated with domestication here. Things like rice, sorghum, and millet. If we move into the Americas, we have early evidence for agriculture in places in the eastern uh, United States, particularly of things like goosefoot and marsh elder. We also have evidence in the North American Southwest and moving into Mesoamerica of, of crops like gourds and squash, beans, corn, as well as the domestication of birds like turkeys. Finally, we have evidence for domestication in South America, where we see things like beans, potatoes, gourds, tomatoes, as well as guinea pigs and llamas being domesticated. And what's really amazing about this domestication process, I think in South America in particular, is that you see the early cultivation of things like tomatoes, which we often associate with uh, foods in Europe, like Italian food, right? But these are products that only grow originally in South America and were introduced into European diets after the 16th century. So in what remains of our class today, I really want to focus on domestication in North America. So there's evidence for domestication particularly in the North American Southwest, that dates to about 10,000 BC, when we see a kind of critical transition from a hunting-gathering lifestyle into a more sedentary and agricultural producing subsistence system. Crops cultivated in Northern Mexico for some time before this 10,000 BC date reached the American Southwest around 3000 BC. The earliest Mesoamerican crops to cross the Rio Grande were maize, beans, and squash. The hypothetical scenario for maize domestication in the Mesoamerican Southwest region goes like this. Basically, sometime between 1300 and 6000 years ago, wild tessanite was transformed into primitive corn through unintentional human selection. Gathering tessanite would lead to selective pressures for harvestable types of grass with spikes shrunken into bunches. So you can see in the image behind me on the left is a tessanite seed and on the right is a fully called domesticated version of corn. So these bunches of tessanite would have made it harder for the seeds to scatter. These kind of plant colonies, tessanite colonies, would diverge towards greater domestic kinds of variation from which humans could select the most useful types. Over time, this form of tessanite would become established by campsites and in abandoned middens or trash pits near settlements. Humans would remove weeds from these tessanite plant colonies and then begin to kind of deliberately plant the more useful types. This process is what converted 
the hard fruit cases of the tessanite grass into shallow, softer cups that carried elongated husks, enclosing and protecting the corn kernels. So human intervention with the tessanite plant would have had the following effects. They would have selected for semi-tough reishis, which are the stalks that connect the grain um, to the actual stem. They would have selected for thin glooms and husks, which would have allowed for easy peeling and access to the grains. They would select for larger and more seeds to intensify uh, the, the amount of yield from any given um, harvest. They would also uh, select for the kind of natural seeding ability, so for plants that are most effective at distributing and growing their own seeds, and eventual relocation to new ecologies with new selection regimes. So they would look for plants types that would be particularly resilient to being transferred to different climates. So maize farmers of northern Mexico probably had sporadic contact with hunter-gatherers living in the deserts to their immediate north. This would have allowed knowledge of maize plants or even gifts of seeds to pass along a north-south corridor from Mesoamerica into the North American Southwest. Between 2500 and 100 BC, the southwestern climate was relatively stable, but rainfall patterns were unpredictable. This made hunting and gathering a high-risk subsistence strategy. Domesticated plants had a major advantage over this hunting and gathering lifestyle. Even though they were low yield, they were predictable. You could control the location and availability to a much greater degree than you can with natural growing plants. Although the exact reason for why people in the Southwest adopted agriculture is a little unclear, it was probably a combination of the rising constraints of increasingly consolidated populations as well as food shortages. The Ho'okam culture arose in central Arizona during the adoption of agriculture in the American Southwest. The contemporary descendants of the Ho'okam are the Tohono O'odham people who live here in Arizona today. The ancestral Tohono O'odham people occupied the Sonoran Desert near modern day Phoenix between roughly 500 and 1450 AD. Perhaps the most extensive Ho'okam site ever to be excavated by archaeologists is called Snake Town, which is located in southern Arizona. Snake Town was excavated in the 1960s by Emil Howery, the person whom the Howery building is named after at the U of A. At the height of its occupation, Snake Town contained between 1,000 and 3,000 people, making it one of the largest aggregations of people for this time period in the American Southwest. Emil Howery's excavations revealed that the population at, in these Ho'okam villages, or at Snake Town in particular, lived in pit houses. These are kind of shallow and rectangular depressions in the earth, constructed of logs, and then covered in reeds, saplings, and mud. So in the image next to me, what you're seeing is the outline of those pit houses, and you can see all these round holes where you would have had a post, wooden post, for the roofing. Holcomb's subsistence was based on maize, beans, squash, and melon production, but people also grew cotton for clothing and textile weaving. The people living at these sites, at these Ho'okam sites, planted their crops to coincide with semi-annual rainfall and flooding patterns. Cultiva cultivated floodplains caught runoff from local storms using a canal system, which fed water to the nearby fields.
So in this image here, you're looking at the extensive network of canal systems associated with the Hohokam occupations of Southern Arizona. So these irrigation canals were shallow and wide, on average about 10 feet deep and 30 feet wide, and some of them reached 10 miles in length. People would have used woven mats as dams to help channel and control the flow of water within these canals. The extensive irrigation system developed by the Hohokam allowed them to have a more sedentary lifestyle and to aggregate in large population centers like Snaketown. In addition to these extensive canal systems, we also have evidence for the construction of monumental architecture, very similar to what we discussed at Jericho. So what we see in the Hohokam area are the development and construction of ball courts. Particularly at Snake Town, there's two giant ball courts, one of which you see depicted here behind me. So in these ball courts, you would have had ramps from either end that led to the court floor. To date, over 200 ball courts have been identified in the Hohokam region. These ball courts resemble structures found in Mesoamerica. Archaeologists hypothesize that these courts were used for a similar type of ball game than we see in Mexico. Basically, the idea was that you had these courts that would be used um, for gaming between two teams in which you had a rubber ball that would be put through this, these kind of loops or holes, kind of like modern day basketball. Except these ball courts were associated with huge ceremonial events that were intended to bring different communities together. Another distinguishing feature of the Hohokam culture were large platform mounds. A typical mound was rectangular in shape and about 10 feet high. Roughly 50 platform mounds at 30 different villages have been identified throughout Southern Arizona. These mounds would have been primarily made between 1100 and 1300 AD, really at the height uh, of the Hohokam culture uh, and aggregation in these areas. Archaeologists believe that the residents placed on top of these mounds were occupied by high status political religious leaders. Alternatively, there's some evidence that the mounds may have also been used for communal rituals and ceremonies. Either way, the construction of these mounds would have taken a significant investment of organized labor and offer evidence for parallel developments of social hierarchy and inequality in the Americas. More than a thousand elaborately decorated pots, stone bowls, and bone artifacts were found at Snake Town and similar places within the whole Calm region. These ceramics were constructed from brown clay and often decorated with red geometric designs like the one behind me. Artifacts from Hohokam sites such as Snake Town suggest that Hohokam people were regularly trading and interacting with people outside of the Southwest. For example, pots used to burn incest, pallets, mirrors, and ball courts, macaw feathers, and copper bells were all likely acquired through interaction with Mesoamerica, or at least West Mexican indigenous societies. Excavations of the Casas Grande site in Chihuahua, Mexico, points to a mutual exchange with Hohokam peoples. So here in Mexico, we have evidence of, of turquoise as well as distinctive painted pottery from the Southwest. In contrast to the earlier adoption of agriculture, these objects represent the adoption of Mesoamerican ideology rather than direct migration. In module four, we'll continue our discussion of the rising levels of surplus, exchange, hierarchy, and social complexity 
among ancient societies in Southeast Asia and China, and then dive in to a more elaborate discussion of what's going on in the Americas in Module 5.